As we transition into part two of the book, we're going to focus now on numerical methods. They're based on the underlying mathematics of linear algebra, vectors, and matrices that we discussed in part one. And we're going to show how we can take those mathematical constructs and use them in the context of developing and implementing numerical methods, primarily focused on solving differential equations. We'll address some other issues along the way as well, but primarily focused on solving ordinary and partial differential equations. So it's really the advent of the digital computer from the middle part of the last century that has really revolutionized numerical methods and in particular how we solve differential equations. The foundation goes back many years before that, but it wasn't until we had digital computers that we could actually implement these in a large-scale way and address large-scale engineering and scientific problems. And there's really two aspects to this revolution. Let me kind of schematically show this. And let's think in terms of plotting speed versus time. And time here is in decades. So this computational revolution has really been riding two waves. The first is in hardware. So as the years go by, we get increasingly fast and larger computers, not larger physically, but can fit larger problems. And so I can take the code that I wrote as a PhD student, oh, so many years ago, take that same exact code and run it on a computer today, and I can treat much larger problems than I could as a PhD student. In addition to that, there's an additional wave of algorithmic development and software. There's a whole host of scientists, mathematicians, engineers that are developing better and better algorithms for solving these types of problems. So better algorithms on faster computers, we're really again riding kind of this, th these two waves of improvement that have revolutionized the computational approach to science and engineering. Fundamental mathematics that we're going to focus on primarily is that of linear algebra, so vectors and matrices manipulations of these, they can get very, very large. So this is going to be a little bit different than what we saw in part one, where the focus was on solving small systems of equations, small vectors and matrices. Now these can be quite large in the hundreds, thousands, or even millions. So we need very efficient computational techniques for solving these problems. There's a great quote from Dawes in uh, actually a review of a CFD textbook some years ago. And in that review, he made the statement, which I think is very interesting and helpful to kind of understand the richness of this computational approach to science and engineering. The focus here is on CFD, computational fluid dynamics, in this quote, but it applies equally well to other computational areas as well. So the, the quote is as follows. CFD is a modern and rather special expression of fluid mechanics. It is an endlessly fascinating interdisciplinary blend of basic numerical methods, a solid understanding of both experimental and analytical fluid dynamics, software engineering, and pragmatism. So when we think of numerical methods, of course, we think we're studying numerical methods. And we are, at its core, we're developing numerical methods. But it's very important and essential to keep in mind the application of those numerical methods. In this context, it's CFD, computational fluid me mechanics. That brings its own set of challenges because of the physics of fluid mechanics that the numerical methods have to be faithful to and be able to capture. So there's this really interesting interplay between those numerical methods and the physics of the underlying problem, in this case, fluid mechanics. How do we understand fluids and how they behave? Well, through experimental as well as analytical approaches. So those are the three approaches. Traditionally, it was analytical and experimental, and now we have the additional approach of computational. So those are the three legs of the stool. There's also a great deal of software engineering. So this is very practical, computer science-y kinds of stuff that goes into developing these very large codes for solving partial differential equations like the Navier-Stokes equations that govern fluid mechanics. And I've emphasized as well here, and this is why I really like this quote, this need for a pragmatic, for a very practical viewpoint. This is where engineers and scientists, we can take our engineering judgment and we can use that in development of these algorithms and methods and how we apply them to physical scenarios. They're so complex that we're going to have to make compromises along the way in most cases. And so we need to be able to do that in an intelligent way that we know what we're missing, what we're leaving out or what we're keeping in. Now, since this quote uh, some years ago, I now have to add another component to this. I was at a conference not too long ago and the developers of a software package 
we're talking about how they go about developing the next versions of their software and all that goes into that. And of course, they discussed many of these things. It was a fluid mechanics software package, which is my area of expertise. But they also mentioned that they talked to Intel and AMD and these other hardware manufacturers about the next generations of chips that are under development. The implication being they as software developers were looking ahead to where the hardware was moving, where the trends in hardware development were, so that they could be sure to take that into account in their algorithm development, software development. And that kind of just blew my mind. I mean, talk about interdisciplinary blend. I mean, we're going all the way from the mathematics of linear algebra, through numerical methods, through the physics of fluid mechanics, solid mechanics, electromagnetic fields, whatever the field might be, and even now having to take into account computer hardware characteristics and trends in the development of our algorithms. This is a truly complex problem that demands a real engineering systems kind of approach to it. So what I'd like to do is discuss those three approaches, analytical, computational, and experimental approaches to fluid mechanics or other types of problems. Again, I'm going to pose it in terms of fluid mechanics just to focus the discussion, but the points apply equally well to other areas as well. And one slide each won't take long, and you'll see a series of pluses and minuses, advantages and disadvantages, pros and cons of each. So let's start with the analytical approach. The great thing about the analytical approach is that it provides an exact solution to the governing equations. Now there's a downside to that, which will be my first negative. But if you can get the analytical solution, the exact solution of the governing equations, there's no approximations involved. You have the exact solution of the governing equation. You get a great deal of physical insight. So you can see, for example, the relative importance of different effects. So in a fluid mechanical context, you know the viscous terms, you know the convective terms, you know the pressure terms. You can see which terms are dominating in certain areas or regions of the flow and what kinds of physics that produces. So you get a great deal of physical insight and intuition about the flow based on these analytical solutions. A somewhat underrated advantage of using the analytical approach is that you can consider hypothetical problems. So these are problems that don't actually exist, but in order to gain additional physical insight, you can turn things on and off, for example. So you could consider, for example, what would happen if the flow was truly inviscid? No flow is completely frictionless and therefore truly inviscid, but we can make that mathematical approximation and see what the consequences would be. By the same token, no flow is truly incompressible, but in many cases that's a good assumption, and we can see what would happen if we make that assumption. Zero gravity. If I were to do an experiment, zero gravity, that means I either have to go on the vomit comet or use a drop tower or I have to go into space. All of those are very expensive, have a great deal of limitations on space and, and so on. But in an analytical context, I can simply turn off the gravity terms and see what happens. So we can consider hypothetical problems in order to gain additional physical insight. Now the big negative here is that the exact solutions in a fluid mechanical context, and this is true for many PDEs, are very, very limited. They're limited to simple problems and simple geometries. They're also of limited direct value in design, and that follows directly from this first negative. If I can't do complicated geometries that are relevant to a design setting, then the analytical approach and the solutions I get are gonna be of very limited value to a design context. Now, computational approaches, you can think of this as an extension of the analytical approach. We're solving the same governing equations, we're just doing it numerically instead of analytically. Or you can think of it as a separate approach. And some people actually think of the computational approach as being numerical experimentation. You try this, you try that, kind of in an experimental way. But let's view it as a, a separate approach. So you can address more complex problems, both in terms of the physics and the geometries. In that way, it extends the applicability of the analytical approach to a broader set of circumstances. Once again, you can look at hypothetical flows. I can turn off the viscous effects. I can turn off the compressibility effects. I can turn off the gravity effects. And that allows me to test various theoretical models and how good or bad those solutions are in a particular context. I get very detailed solutions so I can see exactly what's going on in the flow. If it's a fluid mechanics setting, I can see does and where does separation occur. Oftentimes, separation is a phenomenon that's very small, very localized. 
but can have a very huge effect, order one effect, on the overall flu mechanics of the problem. So I get those details out of my computational solution. We can perform parametric studies, so I can look at various ranges of Reynolds numbers, geometries, sizes of things, uh, flow speeds, and so forth. So you can look at a parametric study in a similar way that you would experimentally. You can easily try different configurations. You're not building anything physically, you're only building it virtually on your computer. So you can try different geometries, you can try different boundary conditions, and so forth, and see what happens, and see, again, what difference it makes, and gain additional intuition and insight into the physics of the problem, the effect of various geometries, the effect of various boundary conditions, and so on. This is extremely important in design. So the computational approach has direct applications within a design context. Computers are becoming faster and cheaper, and so the range of CFD is always expanding. You can take the same code, don't change a thing, run it on a faster computer, and you get your results more quickly, or you can run bigger problems. Along with that, there's increased potential using parallel processing. Nowadays, pretty much everything has multiple cores. Even my Apple Watch has multiple cores in it. So parallel processing is inherent in most computers today. And if you look at supercomputers, they have often up to millions of processing units, whether that's CPUs and or GPUs and cores. So parallel computing, parallel processing, gives us another avenue to take advantage of the hardware that's available to us to solve even bigger problems. It's typically more cost effective and faster than experimental prototyping. If I want to test something experimentally, I have to design and fabricate the prototype, take it to my wind tunnel. I may have to wait my turn to use the wind tunnel, take the measurements, process the data, and so forth. That's all very time consuming and can be quite expensive as well. So on a computer, I can make the changes to the geometry quicker. I don't have to refabricate something. So it's often more cost effective and faster. Now there are some negatives. It requires accurate governing equations for the physics of the problem that we're looking at. So in a fluid mechanics context, things like turbulence and combustion are notoriously problematic. These are very complex flows. They are not well understood. There's a ton of physics going on. Think of combustion. So you have fluid mechanics, heat transfer, and chemistry. Turbulence is the same way. Very complicated fluid mechanically, and so we often have to use models and simplifications, approximations in order to solve turbulent flows. So we don't always have accurate governing equations. Many times we do, sometimes we don't. We need to be aware of that, and that's an issue because the computational solution is no better, obviously, than the governing equations that we're solving. Boundary conditions can be notoriously problematic. In a fluid mechanics context, again, think of something as simple as an outlet. So this is just the end of a pipe or an outlet to your domain. You're solving the flow. What is the velocity? What are the pressures at the outlet? Oftentimes, we just don't know. Um, turbulent inlet. So you have an inlet. You have a turbulent flow coming into your domain. What are the characteristics of that turbulence? That's not always well characterized. It's difficult to do certain parameter regimes. So in fluid mechanics, we have the non-dimensional Reynolds number, which characterizes velocities, sizes, and viscosities of the, the problem in the fluid. If those Reynolds numbers become very large, then that increases the impact and influence of the nonlinear terms in the Navier-Stokes equations as the Reynolds number increases. So more nonlinearity, more difficulty from a numerical perspective. Okay, so let's look at experimental. Now, before you get too excited, because you only see two pluses and a whole bunch of minuses, you will never hear me say that the computational approach is or will replace the experimental approach. The boundaries between them are changing over time, and the computational approach becomes more realistic and, again, faster and cheaper. So it is replacing some of the need for physical prototyping, particularly in design contexts but it will never fully replace it. So there's always going to be uh, the need for experimental approaches. And the reason is because of this second plus, which I'll get to in a moment. It's highlighted in red, so it's, it's really big and important. So, so don't uh, just look at the number of advantages and disadvantages. All right, so one of the advantages of the experimental approach is that certain quantities that you want to be able to obtain are actually far easier to get experimentally than they would be analytically or computationally. So I give here the, the example of lift and drag on an airfoil. 
And to get those from a computational solution, I would have to take the pressures and the wall shear stresses at every point on the airfoil, integrate them, and then get the lift and drag components. In an experimental context, I simply go get a force balance and I directly measure the lift and the drag. It's that simple. Now here's the big one. There is no modeling necessary. We're testing the real fluid. We're not idealizing it in any way. It's the real fluid. And this is why we will always have a need for experimental research as well as prototype testing and so on. Now there are a number of issues. One is that it, re it requires intrusive measurement probes. Anytime you stick a measurement probe into a fluid in order to measure velocity, say, or pressure, well, you've changed the flow just a little bit because of the presence of that probe. Limited measurement accuracy. Whatever probe you're using, whatever technique you are using for measurement, will have some error bars. It's not perfect. Limited resolution. So boundary layers are very thin layers along solid surfaces in high-speed flows where things are changing very rapidly across those thin layers. You stick a probe in that tiny little boundary layer and you, and you can just obliterate the boundary layer. Support apparatus. So if you go back to this airfoil problem, well, if I'm testing an airfoil in the wind tunnel in a laboratory, it's not an actual flight situation, right? It's in a wind tunnel. That wind tunnel has end walls, side walls, which change the flow. I need some sort of support apparatus to hold the airfoil in place. So all of these things are changing the flow a little bit. And I need to account for that. I need to understand it and be sure that that is not polluting my measurements too much. There are often certain quantities that are difficult to obtain. So some are easier to obtain, but some are actually more difficult. In fluid mechanics, we like to look at the stream function and vorticity, but there is no stream function probe. There actually is a vorticity probe, but it's not widely used. So these have to be obtained from other measurements. Those measurements have errors, and then you do calculations on those measurements to get things like stream function vorticity, and so those errors propagate into those quantities as well. Experimental equipment is often very expensive, and of course it takes up space. And it also can be difficult and very costly to test full-scale models. Imagine if you are a ship designer and you want to test shape of a ship hull. Well, you can't do a full-scale test in a laboratory. You know, so again, full-scale testing is difficult. That takes up space and can be quite expensive. Now, once again, I, you will never hear me say that the computational approach is going to completely overtake the experimental approach. All three of these are highly complementary. The three approaches are essential to better understanding the physics of these complex systems.